Hi, I'm glad to be back with you here with Adam Chapel. Adam, you and Seth farm here near Cotton Plant, Arkansas in Woodruff County. You're, you know, I always like to visit with you because I learn a lot of new things on cover crops and all that. I know you had your back up against the wall, so you, yep. you really had to do some things different. Uh, you really do the, the big biomass cover crops and, and really improve soil health. And, and that allows you to do a lot of different things and, and even, you know, experiment and, and brought you into wide row cotton. I think it really worked good. So mm -hmm. share with us a little bit about how you got interested in wide row cotton and then, and then how, how it worked for you. Well, so the, the wide row cotton kind of came about visiting with some Australians. Uh, you know, I, I noticed they were growing as wide as 120 or 180 inch cotton in Australia in some of the more arid regions and uh, a lot of irrigated 60 inch cotton. And um, it, it was kind of a twofold deal. So the first thing was reducing seed cost. Uh, Cotton seed, as you know, is terribly expensive, and I wanted to reduce seed cost. And the best way for me to do that was to widen the rows and go with a, a bigger, you know, setup that way. And then I had also started grazing animals, and I saw a lot of potential for intercrop between the cotton rows to get a something for grazing established early. So, uh, you know, with visiting with the Australians on how they do it, and I've got a few good contacts down there that I talk to regular and they help me out a lot uh, you know they kind of help me figure out how to do it and we just that's how we started with it so. yeah but but I really feel like you know even like on skip row cotton here in Arkansas where most of our cotton is on 38 so we've got some on 30s but where we have two in and one out that one row skip wheat pressure is 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 a big issue in controlling pigweed and and I think your cover goes a long ways. Talk talk talk. And I was just surprised on how clean your fields look. Talk about talk about how the cover crop you think, or do, do you think the cover crop helped facilitate to make that work really good for you? Yeah, I don't think I could make it work without the cover crop. Uh, you know, we depend a lot on canopy closure to control weeds. You know that. Well, I'm not ever going to get that on 76 inch cotton or rarely, and uh, so I had to have a very thick mulch layer to help me control weeds uh, and and it worked really good uh, you know we used oats uh, vetch and radish last year and let it get really big before we planted and it held weeds back a long time so yeah it, it really helped and you know when you have that wide row uh, Growing up around Lubbock, a lot of times our season's really short and so sometimes we'd have two in and two out so that we could harvest the heat and in the moisture from those outside rows. So you had a lot of opportunity with the increased water infiltration. You had a lot of opportunity for, for uh, really good moisture to, to, to really cheapen your irrigation costs and some other things, didn't you? Yeah, so the things we noticed right away was obviously the lower seed cost because we only dropped 20,000. Uh, then with the you know, the cover and that's, crop a, that's on an acre. That's, that's on an acre, acre basis. Yeah. Acre basis, uh -huh. yeah. So we had three seeds per foot yeah. in the row. So, um, but our nitrogen use efficiency, we put uh, 300 pounds of ammonium sulfate on that cotton, and that was it. That's what is that? 64 units, 65 yeah. units. So that's nothing. And we had a hard time stopping it from growing. So I think we actually had too much nitrogen. Um, our irrigation was almost, I think we might have watered twice the whole year. Yeah. I mean, we did catch some rains, but still, most cotton guys were watering a lot more than that. Yeah. Uh, you know, we just had more area for those roots to draw from, and you know, we weren't losing it to evaporation because of the cover crop, and, and our infiltration rates are going through the roof the last few years, so. Yeah, you know, sometimes when we look at different things, you know, different people have different objectives, sometimes, we're trying to improve yield and all that. There's there's some things like if, when I go to skip row cotton, I think okay, I'm I'm going to reduce costs on things, especially that I can band. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times on a two in one out, I'm going to make about the same amount of cotton, if not the same amount of cotton. It's just going to take me a little longer to do that. Right. And uh, and so with 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 your strategy, you you, I re I really feel like and and you know I had the opportunity to look at some of your expenses and all that. You went really 
um, deep into being able to reduce your costs without without reducing yield. I know yeah. I know your yields weren't where you want them to be because we had some late planting and Very some late, issues yeah. with we had a crazy fall. Uh, but I would really expect the yield to be the same whether it was solid cotton or, or not. Well, but but reducing your costs and, and you know your fertil you know tell us about your fertility and your herbicide program and all the other things because because I think with your interactions with the cover crops went a long ways toward you being able to greatly reduce your costs. Yeah, so the the field you had all your studies in last year was planted uh, May 28th, I think. I'd have to check my notes to be sure, but it was right at the tail end of the very end, yeah. And then all the rest of my cotton was planted the first week of June. Uh, and for the most part, that cotton did between, that field did 1,100 pounds, that was my best field. And the rest of it did between 900 and 1,000. You know, and then I had a couple on the tail end that got rained out in, de in first of December that did about 650. But uh, I think there was 900 pounds that went there. We just, we couldn't get it. It was shattering really bad. Yeah, it was we had a lot, we had a really wet fall. Yeah. And so again, I, those yields weren't where we want them to be, but I really don't think they'd been a lot different if it was solid cotton. No, but the point is, if I would have planted solid cotton and added another $100 per seed mm -hmm. and added more fertilizer, more irrigation, might have had problems with disease because of the tighter canopy, yeah. you know, more problems with insects, so on and so forth. I mean, I cut my expenses so much that I was still very profitable on 900 pound cotton. Yeah. And that's hard to say in Arkansas. Yeah. You know, everybody put, everybody puts P and K out on their cotton. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tell, tell us yeah, so, tell us what your uh, fertility strategy is. Well, we, we don't put any P and K out. We uh, sap sample, uh, that's another Australian trick, and we are reactive with our fertility. But we have not applied any P or K since 2016. That field that, that you had your stuff on hadn't had any since 15 or 16. It was one of those two years. I can't remember now. It's all running together, but it was a long time. And we pulled uh, sap samples that year, and I think I shared those with you. The N, P, and K was always through the roof. Right, yeah. There was, there's no reason to apply. So, you know, that's what? A, a but that's, that's, because, right? that's because of the living soil. Right, it's cycling. Yeah. It's bringing for, from deep, and yeah. it's just, uh, you know, the soil is a mine of P and K. It's just yeah. most people can't access it. Yeah. And I know this year, you know, tell us about your herbicide costs. I know a lot of people this year, uh, where we are, I know a lot of people that have over $80 worth of just chemical control in their yep. cotton. Yeah, so we, uh, for, for our wide row cotton last year, we had uh, Roundup and then at least 24 hours, usually a day or two. Behind that, we would plant or roll then plant and then put out a, a real light rate of germoxone, like 10 ounces of germoxone uh, with our uh, residual, which was Direx last year yeah. all right and then we had two over the tops uh with uh one with roundup liberty duel that were both light rates and then a light rate of liberty duel uh maybe at first bloom or whatever it was but three herbicide yeah. passes and we were clean and that's all it took that's all it took yeah because even i was surprised you know i had liberty of being in 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 that that one field i was doing a lot of work in even at cut out in a defoliation time we still had a very good mat of residue on the soil mm -hmm. surface and it was holding the weeds back. It was very surprising. Yeah. Okay, now that we talk about that residue and you talk about planting, you had big biomass, which big that biomass. is not an understatement. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but talk about that and talk about, you know, you talked about the diversity you have in your cover crops and you have really good, you have um, religious rotation, so you have a lot, of, mm -hmm. a lot of diversity in your cash crop, you have a lot of diversity in that. How, how do you think that impacts some of the things that, that we run into? Because we hear a lot of things about the green bridge. Yep. And yep. when we get these other things in there about pests moving from one thing to the other, but I think diversity goes a long way. You know, share, share with us what you think on, I, on that. I think so. Um, you know, obviously if you plant soybeans behind winter peas or something like that, you're, you could have pretty devastating issues, but that's basically going from a lagoon monocrop to a lagoon monocrop. That's zero diversity. Uh, where we never plant the same crop in a field twice, you know, we'll be cotton, corn, beans, and now row rice. We're starting to rotate row rice around on places we never would have before. But we always manage our cover crop prior to our cash crop to be diverse and not 
anywhere close to the same as what's going in. So if it's corn, we'll be heavy in broad leaves, light on grass. Uh, you obviously want some grass for weed control because you need the higher carbon rate, but uh, for cotton, we were heavy grass and brassica and light on legumes. We had one pound of vetch in that, that, that we had that in last year. And, uh, you know, soybeans, we don't put any legumes in our mix yeah. at all. Uh, it's just grasses and brassicas. So uh, we try to really mix it up and and kind of have a plan, not just throw something out there, you know, just to see what happens. So, yeah. But as far as diversity, when you have plant diversity like that, we see huge insect diversity. I mean, you know, we sweep all our cover crops before we plant just to see what's out there. We scout them. I mean, that's what. I've got a yeah. Craig Shelton's my scout. He looks at that stuff. We want to know what's out there. If we have a problem, we'll deal with it. But if not, then we don't. Uh, you know, we don't spray any insecticide behind the planter or any of that. But uh, when we sweep cover crops prior to planting, usually we'll find, you know, a hundred different insects in our sample. Okay. And you may have one that would be considered a pest. The rest of them will just be, you know, inconsequential or predators mainly. Yeah. Uh, tons of spiders, th you know, things that... Yeah, I saw be a lot of beetles on the ground. Tons of beetles, yeah. lots of ground beetles. You know, people worry about uh, cutworms and slugs and stuff, and if you've got a healthy, robust ground beetle population, you're not going to have either one of those. Okay. So, uh, stopping tillage and giving some habitat will solve a lot of those problems. Yeah, you know, if, if you, and, you know, that's, that really gives us a great start, or uh, great information on the, on the start of our season with related to insects. But you know, if, if we visit with cotton farmers in Arkansas, the two main pests are pigweed and plant bug. Mm -hmm. And we talked about pigweed and your residue and the impact that had on that, and you had a very cheap program. Mm -hmm. But going with the insect part, carry that on to the end, into the season and talk about the plant bugs. Because I know on average, uh, when I visit with Gus and, and look at farmers, you know, most people had anywhere between four and six applications for plant bugs. What what did you what did you so see? So the farm average last year we had just over one. It was like one point four when you average across the acre. So a few fields got sprayed twice, but everything got sprayed once. And uh, we were able to get by with, you know, really cheap insecticide, imidacloprid. Uh, we didn't have to use a transformer, or, you know, any big expensive mix. We just were able to get by with a, a Good so you know when you look at insect control ratings that's doesn't that's not really high so so with so did you have the level of beneficials there and just a little bit of bump because that's that product's pretty easy on beneficials yep. did, did you just give the beneficials a little bump and that's why you didn't have any more treatment or what what do you think's going on because I, I know i didn't mention you know adam's uh uh is has a uh, your master's you have yeah. a, um, an undergrad in in botany yep. and mm -hmm. your master's in entomology yeah so you know you know way more about bugs than i do <laughs> <laughs> well i like bugs a lot uh, but one of the i don't know if it's, i mean it's not really a mystery i mean we know what's going on you know if there's pests out there and there's a predator to eat them they're going to eat them yeah if you don't kill the predator they're going to find the prey i mean it just predator prey cycle it works the same everywhere but um, do you think that cycle is a little different in I think your it's production very different system in our production system than it was five years ago okay. or ten years ago before when we were just carpet bombing everything yeah I think you had pretty uniform cost reductions all the way over because as when you shared your books with me and then we, we looked at those your your out-of-pocket was less than half of, of what we have on our budgets yeah yeah yeah, we had reductions in irrigation costs and fertility, and then even in machinery costs. I mean, you're talking about when you take away all the hippers and the bed conditioners and okay. things like that, we're talking about a roller pass, a planter pass, some sprayer passes, and a picker. And with the wide row picker, you're gaining 15% efficiency every time you turn around because okay. you're skipping a row. So that wide row, we think that that helped you further reduce costs than you would be, say, if you were on a on 30s or a 38 with a two row, uh, two in and one out. Yeah. That 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 allowed you to to save cost even more, I think right? So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we didn't have any bowl rot. Think that I know that's some target spot things like that that are yeah. big topics these days. We didn't see any of that. 
because of the increased airflow, I guess, yeah. in the wider row. Describe your plants a little bit, because I thought that was very fascinating. Oh. Uh, they come up, and, and I could not believe one row could get so wide. Yeah, they, uh, well, from the road, it looked like they were lapping, but I had too many plants. 20,000 is too many seeds. We figured that out. We really need to be around 15 or 16,000 seeds. But where we had a perfect stand, we'd have the plants grow up and then grow away from each other. And then the branches on them were, I mean, they're huge. They were yeah. look like turn row plants, yeah. but. We had a tremendous top crop and they were just, yeah. they were just, just laying over. over. Yeah. yeah, it was really, I can only imagine what that cotton would have done had our, you know, had we been able to get in early. That's, that's gonna be the key, I think, okay. to making a big yield. I don't think there's any reason we can't make a big yield with skip row cotton and 15,000 seeds. Okay. All right, so, you know, we can always, you know, hindsight's always 2020. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've got, I know several growers in Louisiana, and I know there's already been growers in Texas that are doing the 60 inch cotton. Mm -hmm. I've seen some 72, I think 72 inch cotton advertised on social media. Probably. But yeah. if, somebody, if somebody's looking at wide row cotton, what are some things that, that you could pass on to, some things to do and maybe some things not to do well <clears throat> so make sure you have some kind of way to control weeds preferably a, a mulch layer so you're not spending a ton of money on herbicide so i would always start with a good cover crop whether it's just grass or grass and brassica at least have something that's going to provide some weed control um, and don't plant as many seeds as your reps tell you to because <laughs> they're going to still tell you you need twenty-five or thirty thousand or whatever. That's just not. It's just not right. I mean, when you see plants growing away from each other, that tells you they're too close together. Okay. So, you know, maybe take what they say and cut it in half. I don't know, but yeah. I'm going to be around fifteen to sixteen thousand from here on. But uh, uh, and then watch your fertility. Uh, you know, with all that ample space. Those plants grow hard, and uh, you know we had to really stay on top of things with our mepiquat. We probably could have cut our nitrogen fertility by 20 units and never seen a difference. Okay. So, you know, yeah, the, I the can 90 just, to 100 pounds yeah. is not, it's too much. Yeah, I can just imagine, you know, the sap analysis I think really goes a long ways, but I can really imagine the, the, the availability of nutrients to the plant because as you have all the you know the living soil helping to supply nutrients and water to the plant because i know even in a uh, uh, 38 inch solid cotton when we get in and we improve water infiltration rates and we have deeper rooting zone well then i often find myself i have we have too much nitrogen out mm -hmm. there when the farmer uses the same rate on that as he's using on his conventional till right so when we get in that situation uh I don't know how much is too low, and I think I'm really interested in the, the sap analysis. Yeah, yeah, the sap analysis is a real time, it's like a blood test. I mean, it, it tells you what's going on in that plant right then, and it's really helpful. Okay. So, uh, but, and then if you're going to try the wide row stuff, you know, embrace the point of it. The point of it is cost reduction. So you don't have to make three bale cotton to make a hundred pound profit. You know, you can. On wide row cotton, the way we did it, you could have made a hundred pound profit on seven hundred pound cotton. So, you know, it takes a lot of pressure off of you. Yeah. So you're not going back to. Uh, never. 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 I'll never grow thirty eight inch cotton again. I can yeah. tell you that. Yeah. Next year we're going to grow some uh, seventy six inch uh, UA two twenty two. Okay. So we're going we're going to go back to conventional and then still keep our liberty. Uh, because we got to figure out a system that works good for the conventional, but um, with um, we're going to build a, a hooded sprayer that fits under 76 inch rows, so we can spray germoxone and yeah, okay. stuff like that. We're going to band some brake on our, you know, on our plant okay. on our tops. Yeah. We got a plan. We just got to enact it. So, but can you imagine the break even using conventional cotton on that system? Yeah, that would, it'd be that would be. It'd be tough. It'd be nothing. It would be nothing. Yeah. And UA222 is a beast. I mean, we had it in 16 and 
had several fields in the three bell range, you know, yeah. just in our just in our 38 inch setting. So it was it's a great variety. Well, Adam, I appreciate you visiting with us today on on the wide reel cotton. I know there's there's a lot of interest in wide reel cotton, and hopefully this will get somebody that's interested in looking at that, thinking about that, thinking about because it's always it's always important to know what to do as opposed to what not to do on things. Right. Uh, but that certainly kind of helped get people pointed in the right direction. All right. Well, thank you, Adam.